Hi, and welcome to this edition of the Community Book Club hosted by the League of Utah Writers. My name is Rachel Bush. I am the president-elect for the League of Utah Writers and uh, chapter president and author and things. Tonight, this wonderful panel that we have is going to be discussing Paula Mendoza's book, Play for Time. Paula Mendoza was our workshop presenter for the prequel conference and uh, it was absolutely wonderful, and I can't wait to hear discussions about this book of poetry. And I would like to turn the time over to J-Rod, our moderator. All right. Howdy, folks. Uh, my name is J-Rod Garrett. Um, pronouns he, his. Um, little things I do, I am co-founder of an organization called Utah Black Artists Collective. I am a member of Infinite Monkeys um part of the league i write both poetry and fiction those people who are familiar with me are probably familiar with my poetry because i kind of just do that all over the place um but i'm working on my first novel right now called breakers of war now we have two wonderful folks who are with us here um uh, actually um we have other panelists and in, my, in the interest of um, trying to do this best, I'm going to allow them to each introduce themselves. So there is Kelly, Sierra and Mark. Go ahead in that order. Thank you. Okay. Well, hello, good evening. I'm Kelly Moore. Um, I live in Idaho. Um, got my bachelor's degree in creative writing from BYU Idaho and I am primarily a poet. I don't know what else there is to say. This is my first panel, so I'm really excited to be able to discuss poetry. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to say that Kelly also started the Storymakers Poetry Group, if anyone wants to join. Um, okay, so hi, I'm Sierra Wilson. I once lived in Utah, and I loved it, but now I live up in Canada, which I also love. Um, you can hear my voice is not so great. I actually have COVID. It finally came for me, but it's not too horrible. So it's on the mend, um, but I'm excited to be here. Grateful for technology. A um, little bit about me. I write picture books and middle grade novels primarily. I also write poetry um, in terms of publishing. The works I have out so far are picture books, some of which are poetic picture books. Um, I'm also a student at, in the creative writing MFA program at Lesley University, currently working on poetry and children's literature. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be with this group tonight. Okay, so those are my, my two panelists. Um, I'm gonna run this a little differently. I would like those people who are in the audience to also introduce themselves because you know, we're going to, this is going to kind of be a party. Everyone's going to get a chance to say things, talk about things. We're reading poetry tonight, folks. We are reading poetry because poetry is gorgeous. So totally um, share, tell us know who you are and all that jazz. Thank you. Mark, you. <laughs> okay. Um, see, I've been writing, uh, since early college back in the Jurassic. Um, I've uh, done a lot of poetry and uh, a lot of years that was primarily in songwriting. And then I've done some more exploration of just various free form and forms. Uh, recently got back into fiction writing about four years ago and have put out some fantasy novels. I've been doing some gaming rules and I put some dragon poems in my fantasy novels. So awesome. Yay, yes. Utah Poetry Month. Or is it National Poetry Month? It but is poetry National month. Poetry Writing Month, actually. Indeed. Yes, indeed it is. In fact, tomorrow I am going out to um, share some of my own poetry, uh, a thing at the Queen Bee in Ogden. So no, it's kind of a good time. Valerie, I know you're you're muted right now, but would you share us a little about who you are? Because I'm so interested. 
I'm Valerie. I've got some distractions kind of in the background. I just thought maybe I would pop in and listen tonight. I love to read and study poetry and I like to write it here and there. Um, I, I often write uh, personal memoir pieces and I don't know, just wanted to be a part of the group tonight. Excellent. You, might, you might not hear much from me because I do have a bunch of distractions surrounding me in and out of the room, so. Are these the small purring distractions, the small yelling distractions, or the small barking distractions? Mostly barking and meowing, um, and and an upright human too that <laughs> sometimes <laughs> has a lot to say. So, anyhow. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, thank thank you for introducing yourself. Okay. So, how I wanted to open up our discussion tonight is all right. So, so this book, um, Paul Mendoza's. Playtime for Poems, which is fantastic. You should go to the, the League's website, not with League's website. There's a place called bookshop.org, which Rachel, could you drop that in the, the chat? Like about the, uh, where the, people can pick this up because it's a fantastic book and you oh, absolutely well, should pick this up. Um, what I want to start with is because we could like diagnose poems. I want to get into what you love. I want, so each person here on my little panel here, or there's three of us, I want y'all to share with us, read to us the poem that made you say, I love this woman's poetry. The it whole poem? And, 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 and I know <laughs> Mary Wilma end up being like, the whole book, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I have so many pages dog-eared here, it's not even funny, but like, Pick a poem. Like there's, there may be one poem in here like like that really speaks to you, and I know that poetry is best shared verbally. So, if you find find that poem and share it with us, um, there, yeah, I have too. several poems in here I earmarked, mm -hmm. but the poem that um, this is one of many poems that took my breath away. But uh, so I'll share it because I'm, I'll share because I want to prime everything. This poem is called Not a Mermaid. <laughs> Those aren't gills. Someone has cut slits into your neck. I love that one too. Yeah, me too. That was really striking. Well, that, that, okay, so here's my question. So about this poem. Do you know that person? Cause I know that person who like, they, they like, they live like, like they're a mermaid. It's straight up. Someone cut slits into their neck and they're trying to figure out how to live that way. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a beautiful statement on trauma. It's... Yeah. Well, and that for me, I have marks all through I have marks all through here. I'm I'm one of those people when I read poetry, I write, I write in the margins. Um, Wait, you have a you ha you have a conversation with the poet? Mm -hmm. Marginalia is one of my favorite poems, um, but definitely it's it's a dialogue. So, um, but the one <laughs> the one that really stood out to me, like that one, was very very succinct. Was poetry is senseless, like some violence, um, and that was just like a another sucker punch short succinct and you know very moving I feel like that you know it doesn't have to make sense it doesn't need to Ooh, we're gonna dig into that in a, in a few minutes like why does poetry not have to make sense yeah thank you so much Kelly Sierra okay it's hard to choose let's see I know I start no, the questions are not going to get any easier all night long. <laughs> They're just going to get worse. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. I think I'm gonna, there were several, but I think I'm going to go with lyric. So let me get that one open. Oh, yeah. I was just looking at that one, too. Yeah. I what got page it. is that I, one on? I, so 24. I got the ebook version because shipping in Canada is not so great okay and the paper version it's page 24 okay awesome all right so here we go i'm gonna read it lyric perhaps this too is a move 
Listen, here's another. Not unlike the way vines clamor glossy up a trellis. That is cloying. I'm sorry. Maybe if I hold myself up against this one beam of light to burnish a collarbone soft as how you used to kiss along its slope, we can find our way back there. I can be backlit by lens flare for you. We can be swallow gold in the sepia of it, and my hair will be something more than the clog pooling murky water around our ankles. It can find its shine in a line. It will be a heavy curtain of secrets. Or wilder, as in weather. It has been storms before. It has been various hours of night. I have been wanting to write outside of thinking, but it's hard out here for a poet. I'm stupid with spring and impatient with those that refuse to burst, too stubborn to purple such sudden luxury out of the ground. I know, I know, always with the garden flowers, but really, what of our fresh foolishness can compete with their dumb bloom? We should all be that ready to die. So for me, there were just all these different parts that I was, you know, circling and thinking about. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, so it's hard to even choose which part to focus on first. I love this one part, though. I have been wanting to write outside of thinking mm -hmm. and thinking about what that means as a writer and what the possibilities are with that. But I also, for, in terms of just imagery that hits you it was the we can be swallowed gold in the sepia of it mm -hmm. and my hair will be something more than the clog pooling murky water around our ankles and that one just hit me so much in terms of thinking about how do we perceive ourselves how can one aspect of ourselves be looked at in all these different ways in this case the hair um and just kind of the tragedy and the emotion that comes through there too and showing there's so much that's revealed about the relationship in that one image. I love the sound of this poem. She uses consonants in such a beautiful way with the, the clamber and cloying and lens flare and like all the L sounds just give it a real, I don't know, it kind of sets the tone, just even the words she uses. And I love the I love the fact that throughout this poem, like not just this poem, but throughout the whole book, her use of um, nouns as verbs, um, you know, to purple such sudden luxury. I just I love it. I love the playfulness she has with words that yeah. creates. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of great word play. Mm -hmm. I love too how she's very self aware about writing and about herself as a poet, and I think that really comes through in the flowers portion yeah. at the end you know like oh. I know I know flowers but throughout throughout this whole um volume of poems I wrote ha ha so many times in in the margins <laughs> because she does she has these brilliant little almost like breaking the fourth wall <laughs> mm -hmm. like as an yeah. aside oh yeah right with the goddamn flowers it's like yes <laughs> yes oh I'm I'm so happy that he picked this poem. So one of the things I was thinking about as I was digging into all of these poems was so for for those who are not like studying poetry and have not like studied poetry for like 10 years, there's this concept in poems known as a volta. A volta is this part where you put a you insert a twist into a poem. All poems, or I shouldn't say all poems. I would probably say all good poems have a volta where they twist it. Now that's not saying the poem can only have one. It can have many. And like my favorite part about this poem is the volta at the very end. Because you're exploring all of this in the sense of being alive and doing all of this stuff. And then she inserts at the very end of this poem, we should all be that ready to die. Yeah, I love that too, especially with the contrast of, you know, saying, oh, flowers and poetry, that's so mundane, and then switching it up on you and taking a completely different view of the flowers. Yeah, right. I like I like how she uses like photography. Um, you can tell that she's a visual artist as well in, in the sense of, you know, the cinematography within her poetry. So right. the lens flare, the backlit, 
Um, mm -hmm. It's almost got a real dreamlike uh, flashback quality to it. That, yeah. you know, flowers are something that are very ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And so it, she really kind of captures that with the permanency of photographs. Yeah, the sepia tone, all those parts. Yeah, the kind sepia tone. A lot of her poems referenced photography and film in different ways. In film, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, the, these are very modern poems. And I think um, like the title of this list, this, this collection, Playtime for Poems, is so appropriate because I'm like, there's so many poems here. I'm like, you just sat down and was like, what can I play with today? Mm. Yes. Well, and I was I was speaking, I, I don't know if it's cheating, but I spoke to Sierra earlier. <laughs> and just the very first poem, there is a moment where it's like. Um, you know, it's called spell, like incantation, you know, like, um, but I You're remember y'all cheated and already, like, we're already talking about this. No, just I, very I'm, briefly, I'm, I'm, <laughs> just very, you know, very briefly. I'm going to say, say, guess what? Y'all should, ch one of the two of you is reading this poem now. There you go. Ha. Oh, <laughs> hi man. there. This was a difficult Your mom's one awesome. for me. I love you. <laughs> because... Because later on, like the one where I said poetry, you know, it's like, it's senseless. I feel like this one was play. This one was, this was like a celebration of the sounds of poetry and the rhythms of poetry. And it didn't necessarily make a lot of sense to me. So I was worried at first that I was like, are we supposed to figure out what it means? And I came to the conclusion that no, you don't need to know what it means. You can still enjoy it for the sounds, for the, for the playfulness, for the the way that she makes consonants and vowels, you know, in a cacophony and then just enjoy it for what it is. Share with um, us that cacophony. I, I want to oh hear you share this poem. You, Please as forgive I said, me if I mispronounce words that I don't know. This otherwise. I'll okay. read it, but please, please bear in mind that sometimes, what if I pronounce something wrong? I've got imposter you, syndrome. No, I'm crazy. You up are nervous well, about a lot of these can, are not very common words that. either. Yeah. All right. All right. Spell. After Antarctica and before the viscose, in between hearts, Aarsha and chamber music, a paltry offering when you took what you could get. Uh, forces unseen, rhubarb, the crenellations, the note read ship her back to mother. When I'm not around, bad things happen. A hero like Captain Planet's mullet, I am taking the pie with me. I unsubtle it. Some mornings, abacus and other nights, Varushka in the bed on fire. Tinder, even if shriveled leafless. For Scytha, for instance. In my net are Numa, I pin onto tiny sateen pillows. Iridesce, you're dead. Commandment after commandment trembles my little chisel, shattered the slab. I can be forgetting the low-hanging mysticals, salamandrine and or, or begotten. I shimmy onto my hind hooves, come time to be stood, end to end and into eating my tail, haberdasher, her Kremlin, Siam. Chortle your knockwurst and slut it for the creamdom. Helsinki gone down to singing Megadeth. Mourners hum accompaniment, most free jazz and coke jingles. Teach it to sing and feed it full of murka. Man's business is mastery. It's way better when you read it out loud. It, it's fun to say. It feels good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow. And that, that's one of the beautiful things about the pieces here. These are not pieces like in, in good poetry is not meant to just be like, oh, look, I read this page. It was good. You should read it out loud. It challenges wow. you. Yeah. It should, it should challenge you. I feel like good poetry should challenge you, should make you stop. The way that she has the, um, the double colons to, to interrupt things, it makes you stop and reread it again. And Captain Planet's mullet, I'm sorry, was one of my oh, favorite yeah. lines. <laughs> yeah, me too. That took me right back to like early morning cartoons. Big time. Yeah. I think one interesting thing about this with the choice of punctuation is that uh, with the double colons, the only time I personally have seen that is in analogies, you know? Do you remember like in old standardized tests, they'd have analogies and it would always have the double colon. And I wondered if maybe one, at least one way to read the poem 
is to say that all these things are being connected as like this analogy, this analogy, this yeah. analogy, on and on. And kind of looking this at, is to this as this yeah, is Yeah, and this. kind of looking at the way that poetry yeah. can and does connect things that we wouldn't have thought of connecting. And no. And can you oh, say, ahead, please. Turtle, you're not worst without smiling. I don't know. I couldn't. <laughs> Turtle, you're not worst and slut it for the creamdom. Yes. <laughs> yes, that was great. Really, I know hearing that out loud definitely took it to a different oh. level. Well, and that kind of is the spell, right? That's the spell of poetry is bringing connections, bringing in thoughts that we would not have had, something fresh and new. Absolutely. That's why this poem is called Spell, very clearly. These are all spells. They all, and no, these are spell, the purpose of these spells, like, and I study poetry, so like, I look for like the meaning, like mm -hmm. all these things without the title, all of them are just randomly things here. But when we add in the term spell, mm -hmm. all of these are incantations that create specific types of emotions in us, whether that's laughter, whether that's solemn, whether that's, did, can we get away with saying that at home? Cause I'm, I'm, I, I find myself chortle, you're not worse and slut it for the kingdom. I, I, can we say that in a poem? And then like my next one that I'm like, that I keep questioning, can we say that at home? Mostly free jazz. And Coke, and Coke jingles. jingles, yeah. Now, now, because keep in mind, I'm not thinking about like Coke as in diet, diet Coke or regular Coke. I'm yeah. thinking drugs. It's a lowercase c. Read into it. Yeah. You read in. Well, yeah. There's, and that's what's so great about a lot of these poems is that there's layers. There's layers you could read it on a surface level. And then you can go back through and pick through it. And I feel like she does a really good job of um, harnessing emotion and articulating it in ways that are unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, she's not telling you what to feel. She's giving you the words and then letting you feel it for yourself. Yeah. And you already get a lot of the word, like, I mean, that you'll see throughout the book. Like, I thought turning rhubarb into a verb was interesting. I mm -hmm. have rhubarb. I have it in my garden and it just kind of got me thinking like, what would rhubarbed mean? Like, how would that, you know, if it was a verb, what would that imply? So yeah, yeah I want mm -hmm. to think about it. I love that about this. It, Maybe it I means feel it like, makes it sour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes it sour it, or tart, you know, and not even an unpleasant sour, but like a, a tang. Yeah. Or poisonous because rhubarb is poisonous. Mm. Unless, yeah, unless it's prepared what? the right way. The the leaves are poisonous. Only the petiole mm. is edible. And See? this is and this is the reason why when we, we do stuff like this, we have more than one person who gets to have an opinion. Because here's the thing, the magic of it. I didn't know that rhubarb was poisonous. I'm like, what? It is? Oh, yeah. oh my it, gosh. And doesn't it take like seven years or something before it's edible? Like you have to reharvest and reharvest and then throw away the fruit the first couple of years. I can't I remember. Know. We just have it growing like crazy in our yard. We had a big clump and then we transplanted it. And my husband actually planted a bunch in the alley. And because they're like, oh, who you know, who doesn't want free rhubarb in the alley? So now there's a bunch out there too. Side note, Canadian alleys are delightful. <laughs> Canadian alleys are not American alleys. Yeah, <laughs> this little, is not a nasty alley. This is like they're gardened walkways. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just like a dirt path, basically. Yeah. But with rhubarb. Yeah. Cool. So a lot of these to me seem to be kind of disconnected, except for the last string. Mm -hmm. um, they actually sort of make sense to me. There's a lot of music connection. So you, yeah, well, it's, and I'm not sure how to connect it with the rest of it, but <clears throat> Helsinki gone down singing Megadeth. 
and you know megadeth is not a mainstream sound right mm -hmm. and mourners hum the accompaniment and that accompaniment is mostly free jazz and coke jingles that's kind of like mourning what's going on with creativity teach it to sing and feel it feed it full of murka so oh. i googled murka while we're sitting here and the best definition I can find is that it's a Punjabi word meaning sweat. Mm. Or it also is the condensation of alcohol vapor while distilling. Mm. I don't or, know. That's the word they're using right here. But anyway. There's a reason. There's another reason for that word. That's short for America. Mm. Oh, America. Yeah. Oh, and didn't, Didn't Coke have that. that jingle that they want to teach the world to sing? Yeah. Where everybody was getting along in a very um, almost yeah. creepy fashion. <laughs> like so much harmony in it, and it's not real. It was right. very manufactured harmony because the world doesn't get along that way for Coke or other branded product. <laughs> so, and Megadeth which, is definitely not a get along type of music. Either. Not harmonious. Oh, no, it's not. It's it's much more in your face, and I'm having a difficult time. Help me sort it out. Kind of music. Wow. It really get. I love how I I love how poetry takes on different dimensions. But I'm not sure what that has to do with Iridesh, you're dead, or Captain Planet's mullet. I'm not sure. I'm taking the pie with me. I'm oh. not sure how that all fits together. So you don't. The oftentimes in poems, it doesn't all come together until you hear, until you're able to recognize the Volta. And I think you, you're onto something here with the Megadeth thing, because the Volta is absolutely um, where it says, because all of this relates, even the charter you're not works and sled it for the kingdom, all of that fits. All of those are magical experiences until Helsinki gone down seeing Megadeth. That's where this poem turns. Because this, is, this isn't the kind of magic we're used to anymore. Every line goes further. Mourners hum accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Mostly free jazz and joke coke jingles. You've heard elevator jazz. No one likes elevator jazz. It's bad for everyone. But and no. And it's accompaniment. It's accompaniment for not only accompaniment for a singer, it's accompaniment for doing something else in life. It's background noise. It's Yeah. Mm -hmm. It accompanies something else that's more important. Yep. And, he, and each time, each one of these lines is a, is a volta. Teach it to sing and feed it full of America. Not America, but America. America. Which we just said is sweat which we also said is literally America. And suddenly now this poem takes, it's now quite dark, actually. These are the kinds of spells that we're slinging in our society now. We're no, we're no longer things that are joyful or fun or bring beauty into our lives. We're into things that are fairly terrifying. And then the last line, man's business is mastery. Yeah. What in the world does man's business is mastery have to do with spell casting? It's like we traded, we traded the beautiful magic for the power of money. Mm -hmm. Well, and now there's there is that feeling throughout throughout. I feel like that might be one of the linking themes throughout all of her poems. Um, one of the things I actually wrote on on one of the margins, <laughs> and I was worried um, because I loved these poet poems, so it was hard for me to write this almost. <laughs> and I said that these poems kind of remind me of rot, that it's, it's gross but sweet smelling. <laughs> um, a little like pus, like that there's something there's something decaying but beautiful about a lot of these. And I definitely feel like even in just the very first one, 
and then it's kind of strung along through there with beautiful lines like uh even the garbage flowers i believe in one of them and oh yes the garbage flowers yeah the that was just such a great image but like throughout it, it there's a real starkness a real grittiness like, you know there's decay but it's beautiful and it's it's interesting how you take these two opposing ideas and you shove them together so yeah yeah I think quite a lot of the poems had that for sure that blend of there'd be beautiful aspects and tragic aspects and dirty and gross aspects and they're all blended and kind of taking you in different directions one of the things um, that I noticed coming up quite often in several poems was this idea of a tongue, a severed tongue, or like a nasty mouth and all these different parts about mouths. Um, and kind of with this spell poem too, um, like what with Mark was talking about looking up words, I felt there were a lot of things that I looked up. There are a lot of allusions in her poetry. And one of them uh, is about Philemon. And I looked up that myth. And so that myth is about um, a woman, Philomel, who is being brought to live with her sister or to visit her sister. And the sister's husband is a king and he's bringing her and he's supposed to bring her safely. But instead he ends up raping her. And when she and he says, you know, she can't tell. And when she says she's not going to keep this secret, he cuts out her tongue and puts her in prison and pretends like she died. But instead, she weaves a tapestry that tells her story and gets the tapestry to her sister. And then her and her sister are able to escape and they're being chased. And then the gods turn them all into birds and each one becomes a different bird. And Philomel becomes the nightingale, which I think is, you know, often associated with poetry and with song. So I found that really interesting that she kept having this severed tongue. And one of the poems, Lucy, again, actually mentions Philomel straight out. Um, so I feel like that's kind of a theme to this idea of like wanting to sing and having a song to sing and also feeling silenced in certain ways and maybe finding new ways of expressing yourself. I think we could talk about this, this volume of poetry all night and I'd be happy. I feel like oh, there's so much to cover. There is. Um, so I have my next question I want to ask of you. Um, I think it relates to that idea of, as I know like, I know I haven't thought about it as much as I would like, but what are the, so, so for the audience who ha, does not sit here and study books and um, how to study literature and all that kind of stuff, writers have these things known as obsessions. Yay, writer obsessions. Every writer has them. These are the thing, these are the topics that they come back to over and over and over and over again because of the fact that they're obsessions, they can't escape them. These are usually ideas that drive their writing. Um, and it's one of the reasons that when you connect with a specific um, artist, you like what they do. For example, um, I know there's a lot of talk about, I'm gonna use Nickelback as an example here. There's a lot of talk about Nickelback and how like you either love or hate Nickelback, but that has to do with the obsessions they have in terms of what they explore with their music. Poetry is the exact same way, considering that music ultimately came from poetry. So that being said, I'd like to ask, what are the obsessions that you can see she has as you're going through this book? A good question. Definitely the film and the photography that yeah. Kelly mentioned before and the idea of the concept of how are women seen and objectified because quite a lot of the poems have a villain I would say essentially they've got a villain character who's a man one of the poems especially was really interesting because um it's hard to find things quickly on the ebook version but 
the woman kept being used with verbs that would usually be used for an object. Mm. Things objectification of women. Done, yeah, things being done to her in various ways. Well, yeah, well, going back to like the, the photography and the cinematography, one of my favorite poems um, was the curator poem on page 32. Um, and I did notice that a lot of the words that she uses are, uh, they connotate violence, um, shriveled iris, crumpled metal car door, torn pages. Um, there's a lot of violent words in there. Um, even the striking out of certain lines um, points back to that violent nature that it's, you know, I, she's trying to write something and she's striking it out. Um, I think we should read this one. What makes me sad is like, I'd like to be like, here, audience, read this. You can see it here, can't you? It's like, the teacher in you. <laughs> it's the teacher in me, but there's also the part Raise of like, like, the most important parts of this poem are the part, is the fact that there's yeah, lines here that are struck out. Mm -hmm. It The poem is incomplete without those lines. Yeah. It talks about the idea of mistakes and how if our lives are missing mistakes, sometimes our lives are less, but... I, I'm going to read this poem for us because everyone else has like read longer poems and I think should join the bunch. Um, curator. If I put this photograph of the shoveled iris next to this photograph of the crumpled metal of a car door, next to this torn page on which one had scribbled three attempts at beginning a letter the first struck out begins. Dear G, we didn't have to end this way. Strike out ends. And the second strike out begins. My dearest G, will you ever forgive me? Strike out ends. Then the third, love, you should have seen it coming. Love it. It will tell a different story than if I placed a length of twine beside a bracelet's clasp and beside those, a piece of shattered tumbler from the bar where he might have wrapped his thick fingers around her wrist and dragged her into the icy air where she staggered onto the sidewalk and spat in his face before heaving her guts. It might say all that, or it might show how the desiccated perennial gestures toward the purple beneath her eyes and the crumpled tin mimics the guts fold when she's coiled into herself and those crossings out transcribe all we need and don't. Brittle petal bent charm, frayed cord, and a placard on the wall that reads, I burned us in ritual. 2011, chlorophyll, sulfur, brass, blood, and salt. Yes. Yeah, yes. Museum worthy is what I wrote underneath it. <laughs> Museum worthy. Yeah. And you read it so beautifully. <laughs> Your reading was great. Thank you. Um, I marked this poem um, in. There's the layers, that, like, I think this is a place where, like, all the, like, I think this poem is a good one for us to talk about with the obsessions because we have the photography obsession of what things look like. She gets such good details as to what things look like. Mm -hmm. We, there's a, I think there's an obsession in these poems with people making mistakes and the humanity of it. Because no, she never sits there and says mistakes are bad. She often keeps the mistakes 
as part of the poem. The um, makes me wonder vibe. what her drafts would look like. I know, right? Because I'm one of those poems. I, I'm a poet that keeps all my drafts, and I reference back to them. But there's a whole there's a whole process here, and I just I love how she mirrors at the end the, you know, the purple beneath her eyes is a photograph of a shriveled iris it's like the purple and the purple and the crumpled tin and you know but i just i i wonder what it looked like before it got to this part <laughs> like to the finished product because it's, it's almost as if we were taken on the writing of it with her with the crossing things out yes she's trying to do this really magical thing where as you're reading her poetry you start being a part of it. You want, you find yourself making place for yourself in this. Sarah, mm-hmm. do you have something to say? Yeah. Or are you just like I <laughs> breathless at the moment? No, I am kind of breathless, which is in my, well, I've got my COVID and my pregnancy. So both make me out of breath, but. Oh my gosh. It, okay, I that's know. a lot. It is a lot. So, you know, I'm always kind of like huffing and puffing these days. But uh, yeah, so, so many like visceral images and those powerful violent verbs. And it made me think of a different poem. And so, J. Rod, you're the boss, but I didn't know if we could read this one too, because I think they can kind of work as companions in a lot of ways. The one called. Absolutely. Uh, Let's do that. Alternate- Honestly, how, how are the people here supposed to experience? what this th- this book means to us if they don't hear us reading the poems. Yeah, so this one, it's alternate ending one. Um, mm-hmm. And I that was one of my other favorites. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of hard to read, like as a woman, you know, it's like a poem. Well, you'll see, you'll see if you haven't heard it. But it's like the poem of tragic growing up and objectification to me. Okay, so here goes. Alternate ending one. And it and this is another one where the visual would help. You can kind of see a little bit, but there are little headings. So the poem like starts and starts again. All right. A little girl sticks pins into the flesh of a forearm, believes the woman she will be must feel each prick and stabbing deeper than she thought she could stand gasped, looked up and into the glass. I saw her catch my breath. I looked her in the eye and cooed. Darling, stop that. Come here. Let me hold you. Let's calm ourselves down, shall we? Alternate ending two. Another man's body moves over another woman. The child watches them kiss. It thinks, I must be someone who someone would want to kiss. The window outside glows and dims 10 times to count 10 years, and it crosses the street. It wears a dress, red lipstick and coal, and she runs towards a man who moves his body around her, and she grows very small inside him as they kiss. Alternate ending three. The revolution has come. The headline reads, daughter found dead. The story goes on to say how witnesses found her hung by her own hair. The tower was a basement. Eradam, the tower was a well. Eradam, she lived. She let down her hair into the well. She let a man climb up her hair, climb out of the tower. Daughter says, he is my friend now. He will never leave my side. So I feel like, yeah, this one, it has all those parts of like corrections, revisions, but so much to say here about what girls today internalize about what they're supposed to be and who they're supposed to be for a man and I just love the twist on Rapunzel right found her hung by her own hair the tower was a basement that was one of those lines that just like gets you and I think the alternate endings all kind of hail back to her cinematography Right. And I think the last one's the most tragic, right? That it's almost like how you want to make the story fit or be beautiful or kind of 
going back to the mermaid poem, like with the gills, trying to spin it in a more palatable way, right? Like, no, no, she let him climb up and he's her friend now. He won't leave her side and with all the other versions, you know, like the, the horror essentially in that last piece of trying to give a positive spin to what's happened and what we've seen in the other versions. Do you know what the word errata means? I mean, I had, I totally looked it up. So I didn't know before, but it's, I think it just means an error, right? Like a thing that needs to be corrected. An from error that. in printing or writing. But when we look at it in this context, this is our Volta, because this is, because there's two places it says erratum. Erratum, the tower was a well. That means we're correcting that, like, because the, the mistake is that where they said it was a tower, it's not a tower, it's a well. And then there's a second erratum, which sounds beautiful. But, but it's, it's an error. <laughs> awful when you understand all the other violence. As it talks about Aradam, she lived. She let down her hair into the well. She let a man climb up her hair, climb out of the tower. Daughter says, he is my friend now. He will never leave my side. That entire process of him climbing out of the tower is what they are talking about earlier. But the story goes on to say how witnesses found her hung by her own hair. He is what is hanging her by her own hair. That is, this poem does not end happy. It ends as gruesome as it can possibly get because he is literally the object by which she suffers a living death. Yep. And I'm going to go back to our, our question that I hate the most. Um, who, who knows this person? Who is this uh, person? <laughs> no, no. Oh, God. Some days. Uh, hopefully, on this hopefully, physical no level. One, hopefully none of the ladies are in here at this time are this person. But I think there is power in us asking the question, who knows this person? Because that gives us a, an element of understanding what she's doing here because this is relatable oh yeah well i think if you look at the first stanza the very first stanza when it says um she looked up i saw her catch my breath so like i feel like there's something in it for all readers you know to like put yourself in that place because how many times do we look back at ourselves as children and ask ourselves you know, is this who I want to be? Is this what I want to accept? What would I say to myself as a child from this perspective? Totally. The part that really hit me as like, ooh, I felt that I've been there was where it says the child watches them kiss. It thinks I must be someone, someone would want to kiss. And I love the use of the word it, right? Like the minute mm -hmm. you start to think of yourself as an object that has to be desired by somebody you kind of lose your humanity become the it right oh, like she, she, got, she grows she's very small started, yeah. yeah she's already objectifying herself thinking okay I've got to mold myself into the thing that somebody's gonna want So like I said before, like it's like rot. It's like an ache, but it's a sweet ache. It's the hangnail you can't stop pressing. It's like, it's uncomfortable to read these, but I want more. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. I make I, a masochist streak. <laughs> personally, I really think one of her obsessions, because it shows up so much, is bittersweet. Mm. The emotion bittersweet is one of her obsessions because she just keeps going back to it over and over and over. And I'm like, that's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Except it's horrible. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it's awful. Okay, <laughs> no, it's beautiful. It's horrible. Yeah. Totally. 
And I love it. <laughs> and even some of the poems where at first you think you're safe and then there's that volta and you think, oh no, I'm not safe. Well, well even in her, like the ones I love, I love the, the two poems uh the where are they the sentimental poem like she just labels it this is my sentimental poem <laughs> this is um but it, so there's sentimental poem and narrative poem like and even those where you think okay this is going to be she's she's already setting it up setting us up this is a sentimental poem <laughs> but like mm -hmm. it still manages to um evoke those emotions and Man, it made me laugh because I do, I work with uh, middle school and high school students. And uh, if I'm being honest, romantic comedies are my jam. It was one of my favorite, favorite lines in the sentimental poem because it's, you know, what, what would you expect? You know, something dark and gritty and artsy and, you know, <laughs> something in black and white and in French or something. And she's like, no, I like romantic comedies. You know, this is, they're my jam. And she's like, this is what we, um, Or this is what the kids say to, you know, where was that? So many lines that I'm missing anyway, but I love that. I love that it, you know, it's very honest. It's more of a conversational poem. It's not quite as like here, untangle this. I'm giving you this and you can untangle it. It's just very straightforward. You know, this put me in a funk for weeks. <laughs> like this is what happened with this. Just a little antidotal, anecdotal story, but it still has a lot of that bittersweet, a lot of that imagery that's evocative of, you know, dark, gray, blue, underwater, um, inclement weather. It gives you a real wintry feel. But she can do that even just through conversational. Yeah. I, I want to ask a question about mystery and poetry um because we as i like what we're, we're going in this direction it's like where we're talking about the straightforward stuff but like i love the part where we talked about at the very beginning like this was mentioned poetry doesn't have to make sense and like a note i want to dig into the place where i'm like I'm like, I have no idea what this poem is doing because I think those are some of the most brilliant poems in here. Um, what, share, share with us a poem that you're like, I literally was like, I have no idea what's going on here. I was just confused <laughs> the entire time. Definitely the first poem was that for me. That was the one I remember. I think because of it being the first poem too, it was like, oh no, what am I getting into? But then on the other hand, it's kind of good. It's like jumping in the deep end, right? Mm -hmm. But let's see if there's another one. I'm like flipping through. I have to decipher all of my own writing <laughs> and then... I do like um, my demon is sad. All it can be is complicit. Yes, that, that, was, that was one, one that, that was like. That's one that I stopped and I, um, I actually, googled. Um, well, at first I thought I'm like, is this a uh, Tagalog language? Because it kind of looked like it, and some of it is, and some of it's some of it I couldn't decipher. But of what I could, you know, I got the translation. Child, go home. That's quiet. <laughs> um within there so that one has a lot of the same of the first one with some um some words and and things cortisol irksome fever gullies magma into desert scape okay some vast yeah. beige so it's got a lot of the same feeling as spell um but oh i love what she does with the mandala with the pedal 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 yeah, like, okay we gotta read this one i, th I think we're, 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 at, we're at that place like we're talking like, let's Cause this one's like one that's like yes it does all those things to dig in to like understand mystery is this poem doesn't mm -hmm. so i can ask the question of who wants to read but um i also know where that will probably go <laughs> i'm uh, i will read this one <laughs> thank you <laughs> my my demon is sad all it can be is complicit 
If reading between parallel realities, your mother, somebody will always be saying goodbye. They are being sucked into the distance or you are being pulled away. Here's what I know. I've shot this scene before. My feet blistered to get here. Not rut or habit, but mandala. I ripple out and shout, pedal, 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 pedal. Such a showy peony. Boatload is a family and I am too sensitive, meaning my feelings are not activist. Go straight to the rot of your happiness. The ground conveys bodies apart. It will be many knots before the wailing subsumes. We are each of us abandoned. All I know folds the page corner of the glyphs shift falter towards intelligible. I swear I made it happen inside. My samesis is no longer spoken. We are severed. They've hunted Babylons to extinction. Our mothers diversify their brood. Cone is the head split, not the egg hatched. In certain light, our features cannot be believed. Healed like no venom's business. How loosing. Nausea esque. Cortisol irksome. Fever gullies magma into desert scape, some vast beige. Fire, then, is mine. Mine is thy fire, then bested under mantle shellac. Crushed a harder heat, where? Basalta grommet, this clean, clean, where? Nihil inkara, ashwe, pate. Bata ume. Kana, tuma, tuma, hi, tuma higi, mik, kana. Indoors, I'm one of nine of bulls. Indoors, I'm the nine of bulls. Batten down the crystal, Mobius. I'm goring for the kill. I love that, goring for the kill. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one. Well, and I love Mobius, you know, just imagining this like infinite and the switch up batten down the crystal like that. Well, and I, I that think I agree. With, I agree with you. I like, I like the, um, feels like the whole last half of it, the volt or the last part of it with the, uh, it feels like a fever dream. You know, it really evokes that um, kind of like hallucinogenic, flashes of imagery nothing really makes sense but you still get that feeling of like the heat and the dryness and the you know mm-hmm. and I like, these words are just beautiful <laughs> and I don't know I didn't look up if if this is a certain language or not that starts coming in or if it's just sound some of it was Tagalog oh is that okay how did it know Tagalog. Oh, I okay. Sorry. I'm like, it's one of those words I've only ever seen written. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's totally okay. Like, you've only seen the word written. I actually served um, um, once upon a time. I was an LDS missionary and I belonged to LDS church. I'm past those days now. However, when I was uh, lived in Hawaii, I had the chance to be among these people. Um, they speak the Ilocano, um, t- Tagalog. Um, I'm trying to think of the other language, but it's not coming to mind. Um, these are languages of the Filipino people. Note, mm-hmm. our our author here mm-hmm. is a Filipino Canadian. Nice. Yay, Canada! Woo-hoo. Um, and I am loving this conversation because I'm realizing that there is more of her culture in here than I'm suspecting, and I'm just like giddy about that. Like, I'm eating that up so much. Well, yeah, own voices and like hearing it from. Mm-hmm somebody who has an authority to use, you know, certain languages or certain. Yeah. Did anybody look up the translation for those parts? Um, I, from what, for, I did some Googling. Oh. I did see child go home. That's quiet. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Within there, the, which one was it? The Bata Amui Kana? Oh. Uh-huh. I think. Okay. Interesting, interesting. I do like her line, the go straight to the rot of your happiness. And, yeah. you know, again, rot is just such a prevalent and right. happiness and rot, the bittersweet, the... Yeah, that juxtaposition is great. Mm-hmm. Well, knowing, that, that, knowing oh. that it's Tagalog is really interesting to me because 
and and that you said that one part meant like go home child in that sense I think it's really interesting then that we've got kind of a childhood connection and being a child and then it flips to like this strong proclamation like I'm the nine of bowls batting down the crystal you know like it's got this kind of I don't know like warrior taking your power back yeah here to kick some butt kind of ending for me I'm goring for the kill so that's an interesting flip there to go from that child connection to kind of proclaiming her power and her space I think there's I think there's multiple demons here. Like, because n- n- none of these actually lead in one direction. And that's mm-hmm. the, the beauty of the poem because like, I feel like the, the demon that's speaking here, the, like at the end you have the indoors, I'm the nine of bulls, batten down the crystal Mobius, I'm goring for the kill. Those feel like they're two different people and they're trying to kill each other and I'm like and I I, I, yeah well the rippling out the the um comment like about flowers you know petal upon petal Mm -hmm. you know that there might be multiple layers to this demon right that you know thing because she says yeah, ripples out ripples out I've, I've shot this scene before my feet blistered to get here but the way she got there is the mandala you know so thinking about it in that sense and the it's folding not, of pages yeah, yeah it's mm-hmm. going to be a, a direct linear route kind of it does it does shift in tone from something that's kind of almost gentle in the you know because it somebody will always be saying goodbye you know there's kind of a sadness and then it you know almost like a peacefulness with the the pedal 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 you know and how it evolves into something fierce yeah this is one that has a lot that you could keep digging into and unpacking for sure Yeah. So there's a couple of thoughts here. Go ahead. Feel, feel free to jump in here. No, by the way, others can feel free to like sh- share their thoughts. Because um, note, when we're doing this work, it is helpful to have more voices than just our own. Because sometimes you don't think of all the things when you're reading it. It just doesn't happen. Please go ahead, Mark. So one thought that I wondered was, well, first of all, the title of, you know, a lot of times people say, and they talk about my demons, my issues, right? And I found this really interesting that it's, my demon is sad because all he can be is complicit. My demon can't ruin my life because the best he can do is help me ruin it. (laughs) And I thought that was kind of a rather interesting angle. I'm not sure how that connected to the rest of the poem, but I really like that line. I think when you talk about the part where, like one of the things that led us to this poem was like exploring mystery. How many of us, now you can raise your hand for this or not raise your hand for this. How many of us here have been confused at the fact that like, you're destroying your life. You don't understand how you're destroying your life or why you're destroying life. You're clear on the fact that you're destroying your life. I can say for a fact, I know I have been there. 100% I have done this. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't, it usually takes me years to like figure out what was going on in periods of my life like that. Sometimes retrospect's the only way you can do that. And I love that you brought that up about, you know, the demon 
maybe we usually think of a demon as an enemy, but if all it can be is complicit, that becomes like a partner almost, mm-hmm. and you can read the poem in a whole different light. Sometimes I think, well, you know, like <clears throat> a lot of times people deal with my issues and we claim them, my demons, my sins, my problems. And even though we want to get rid of them, we also claim them. Mm, they're like our pets. Or we're their pets. <laughs> or we're their pets. Mm-hmm. Although in this case, the demon is kind of, has anybody here ever read the screw tape letters? Parts, I'm not completely yet. Yeah. C.S. So, Lewis? Uh, the, it's all, yeah, C.S. Lewis. It's letters of advice written from a senior demon to his oh. nephew, yeah. lesser demon, giving him advice on how to corrupt and secure the soul of this Englishman. And this title kind of throws me back into that, that this poor demon who's haunting me and trying to ruin my life is really the best he can do is, you know, I'm already messing it up so bad that the best he can do is to like trip me up every once in a while and and make the things that I'm already screwing up just a little worse i mean he can't really destroy my life he just and i'm when i say my i mean whoever the person is and there's times in my life when i've felt this way but everybody you know how many who knows this person who is this person right but yeah it's like the demon is the person is screwing it up so well that the, the demon is all depressed because it's like his job's being done for him. He's yeah. got nothing to do. <laughs> He's bored. He's sad. Mm-hmm. Stole his thunder. Okay, there was another line in here, total change of subject, that made me wonder. Boatload is a family and I am too sensitive, meaning my feelings are not activist. I have no idea how to connect any of these lines to each other. So one thing that stuck out of my mind is an image of a boat full of people trying to cross refugees trying to cross um and somebody is upset that they see the picture and that their feelings are not activist i don't know that was something that jumped into my head now i i can't connect that to anything else in the poem okay so so I know how some poems take time to, so, um, so this poem here, we're reading it and we're like, oh, okay, cool. This poem, don't grasp its meaning immediately and all that. It has all these pieces because they all seem disjunct to not come together. And I'm going to point out, Volta is always what helps us pull things together. The volta of this poem is when it changes languages. Um, crushed a harder heat way, and then we go to Spasalter Gromit, this cling cling way. That's that is the volta of this poem. This is a poem about family, and this is a poem about my demon is sad, all it can be is complicit. Well, the demon, it the demon is the part where they had to assimilate to American culture. Mm. Mm. Can I be a bit of a nerd for a moment and talk about form? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. We are here to be nerdy. We did not come here okay. to be like, oh. Well, I just, I think it's interesting how she chose the form of this poem as she did. It's almost as though it's just one run on paragraph. Whereas in a lot of her other poems, you know, she has them separated into stanzas and she has them um, spaced differently. And I feel like this is meant to to gain speed, to gain momentum, because it is all one block form that as you're reading, you, you start picking up speed. 
Um, well, she actually talked about that as a form concept in her presentation at prequel. Well, oh, that makes oh, me happy. Cool. I wish I had seen it. <laughs> I wish I'd gone. Yeah, this is called um, prose poems. Mm -hmm. There's like two or three of them in the book, if I recall. And mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like that that impacts meaning a lot in this poem. Yeah, as well. you have to get that momentum for sure. And I love, I love that all of her poems, with the exception of very few, are concise and contained to one page or a front and a back of a page. Um, I feel like with the density of these poems, that's as much as my brain can handle. So I appreciate that like I can take a snapshot, again, with photography and cinematography, you can take a snapshot and take time to digest that just that instead of and i've i've read some books of poetry that are absolutely beautiful that are several pages long but it's harder <laughs> it's harder to get the same impact as you can with a single paragraph form so i just i love the fact that she chose that form for this particular poem mm -hmm. it would it would lose something if it wasn't as dense and condensed in this form if it was all spread out like um like what she did with the poem on the previous page, um, which was the left Locked by the, the ship, ship. <laughs> um, which was like three, almost three different poems kind of woven into one. But had she done something like that with form, if I think it would have affected the meaning, it would have impacted it mm -hmm. differently. But I appreciate that she chose the prose poem for this particular poem. Yes. We don't know where the layers begin and end. And that's, the point that I feel like that the point of mystery is to have poems like this where the bottom line is I don't necessarily know if what the meaning of this poem is but I know what the experience of this poem is delivering to me exactly and I feel like um it's a real reader response the author doesn't need you don't need to know the author's meaning you bring to it meaning from your own existence. So whether or not she meant something specific, like this was a boat of refugees, or this is my, you know, my past, and this is what this means. It's what it means to the individual as well. Mm -hmm. She gave us what she wanted to give us <laughs> and left it there for us to do with what we want or what we will. So. Okay. We are at about an hour and 20 minutes into this so before we get to, we ended there was one poem i really 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 wanted to explore with y'all and i really would like to hear someone else other than me read it it's the poem on page 60 called one after the other Ooh, i love the alliteration in this one let me get that one open. I will let y'all fight it out for who, who shares it. One, two, three, nod it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no way. With, <clears throat> our house rule is whoever says they don't want to do it has to do it. So oh, now fine. Do it. <laughs> I'll do it. It's not that I don't want to. I just, I'm still embarrassed by not knowing words. <laughs> It's okay. Words super, are so, my jam. I, I just want to point out, wrong. super, super important. We are okay. here to make mistakes. We don't know all the words. We don't know all the meanings of words. True. The purpose of doing like a, something like this is to explore together. Because not any of us on our own would have been able to get as deep into that poem we, we just did if it mm -hmm. was just us alone. And we had to make mistakes along the way. So let them come. Because uh, in the case that someone from said culture is here and they like, they want to correct you on the pronunciation, they'll do that. And you'll be like, I know how to say the thing now. And then you move on because you're like, I can do things. And they feel hey. respected because you were, you were courteous enough to say, I want to do my best here. Help me out. So it's okay. We don't know Thank pronunciations. You. It's okay. <laughs> Someone who's watching this uh, uh, later on on YouTube will comment and be like, you got that word wrong. And then we're like, sweet thank you for helping us <laughs> thank you yes exactly it's all a mind mindset yes right. I, totally, I was looking up tons of stuff so you're not alone 
All right, one after the other. Luminous with lack, I billow invertebrate, in salt and algal dark, a thing <laughs> making sense one human at a time in this lean doom. The narrative in violet declines chromatically. I order my days by depth of hue. Light is sensible and fathoms where history refused. Before self shades into name, the foreground spores atomic, swaths of nothing to call back or by her name. Loitered at doors, coming or going, I was set against four walls or the shore and sand. Does the story confuse its tense? Does she cohere like skin, how it holds our hells together, syntax and sheath? If you believe there may still be hope, I might still convince you when someone happens in my life, the minutes undulate and bloom. The anthers of stamen burst to cloud my flight, void of story, all flaws and collapse. Let me suspend your dread for awe. Let me care for you in our time of lead. Reels reimagined her unbroken and nameless until I name her unmade. Before maker, she makes herself a thing, making sense in this lean doom regardless of what in fact happened, is happening. The ground or ocean to swell her heavy sunk in salt and algal dark, all light and lack. I just love the sound she uses. <laughs> talk about the sounds the oh sound light there. and oh, lack yeah. and yeah lean lean doom which appears twice it it's a it's a mirrored poem it starts the same way as it ends but it's but like in reverse oh oh now i gotta now i gotta look at this is this a chiasmus one in, two, oh. three four five six seven yeah. Eight, nine, ten. That would be cool. <clears throat> and you did a great job reading, Kelly, by the oh, way. Oh, that was Thank gorgeous. I, the, the reason I was just like at the end, I was like, oh, I was enjoying it. I could tell you were enjoying what you're reading. Dear, yeah. re dear listeners, There's this if you were listening to this, the most important thing about reading poetry, reading it well, enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Savor it. Right. It's meant to be savored. The alliteration is great at the beginning. Luminous with lack, I billow. Like, how pretty. Yeah. I love what she does with the tense here, too. Um, you know, does the story confuse its tense? And then in the last stanza of what, in fact, happened is happening. You know, what? Mm -hmm. I like the way she plays with that. Yeah. It does have a very billowy feel to it, almost like it's underwater. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and with the how the light kind of goes through the water and the the salt and the darkness, it just feels very peaceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also also bleak <laughs> peaceful and bleak but you know it's kind of it goes back to that bittersweet theme too right because just pure sound quality it's gentle and it mm -hmm. has a lot of beautiful parts right like lots of alliteration and lots of soft sounds like bloom and undulate right yeah, but very then, watery type things yeah, you know, yes. like the watery <clears throat> imagery lots of alliteration going on but then it'll have things that like they sound so nice but you think about the meaning you're like oh like how it holds our hells together you know mm -hmm. like, we've got this sort of lovely lyrical quality and yet you think okay but what else what else, what does this mean well, and at the beginning of the third to last stanza, let me suspend your dread for awe. So she mm -hmm. is, she is taking something dark, that ominous feeling, okay. and, and let's transform that into something beautiful, something. Mm -hmm. I like to think of this as a literal light ocean. Mm -hmm. It's an ocean of light. 
But the problem with the notion of light, what we what do we usually get from water? Nourishment. We it's essential for us to live. But if it's an ocean of light, and in this ocean of light we have this algal dark, which the darkness is the things in in the ocean, and it and that 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 part about all lack. We can't get anything out of this. It's this beautiful, beautiful image that just, uh, it sits there in your chest and you're like, man, this is beautiful. At the same time, what do we get out of this image? How does it nourish us? Well, it's with the salt, I feel like that's an important element to that because, you know, we can't drink salt water. You know what I mean? Like it right. doesn't benefit you. It's everywhere, <laughs> but you can't, you can't ingest it. You can't, your body's not capable of processing it. Yeah. So. It is beautiful. Like it, I do. I feel, I feel like I'm watching something underwater as I read it. I like the, um, the way that she orders her days by depth of hue yes. that as, a, as the water gets deeper and the light can't penetrate it quite as well and it gets yeah. darker I like that part too I also love the question was I set against four walls or the shore and sand mm-hmm. it's an image that I really found compelling does the story confuse its tense It's just gorgeous. I feel like I feel like uh, when yeah. I can take that minute of silence afterward, the silence speaks for itself <laughs> after this. We're just right. yeah. If you want to just study literary des- devices on their own, this is a great one for that. And I oh, love absolutely. the absolutely. I love the word play, right? Like she uses the verbs in so many ways here. Before maker, she makes herself a thing, making sense. You know, mm-hmm. just twisting and playing with words and kind of weaving this experience. I want to know, as I'm looking at this, I keep thinking coming back to what I keep wondering, there's so much beauty here and I feel so connected to it. And I keep thinking like luminous with lack and then all light and all lack. And what is the lack here? What is, because that's what makes this sit so heavy because I'm like, I've lost something and I can't even name it. But it's like that thing I've lost is literally everything. Yeah, and that goes back with what you were saying about mystery, right? And in this one, you get a sense of that even the poet is experiencing mystery. Yes. Well, I think the even the phrase that she billows invertebrate like a jellyfish, you know, like there's just kind of a floating sense of um, not apathy, maybe apathy. I don't know. Yeah. It kind of reminds me a little of like a depression or like mental illness where you're you know something's missing but you don't know what (laughs) and you're just kind of going through motions and you don't have the power to go towards something you just float Mm -hmm. that there's a sense of doom and leanness and the lack but you just I don't know get I get the feeling of like sometimes you just have to kind of detach yeah Well, before we finish with our conversation here tonight, I think it's important for us to ask if anyone in the audience has any questions about um, what we've we've shared here tonight or what we've talked about, anything that y'all would be more interested in for us to dig into here. Yes, Mark. Oh, wait, wait. Um, 
Okay, so Mark and then Rachel. Oh. Well, Rachel can go first if she wants. <laughs> oh, you, Mark. Go on. <laughs> sure. Yep. Okay. There's a couple of thoughts I have regarding what. Um, I'm sorry. Tell me your name again. I'll mouse over it. J Rod. Which one? Yes. Said Mike? about. No, he was asking about mine. Oh. J Rod. Yes. Okay. Yeah. J Rod. About. Um, whether or not it needs to make sense. And um, this is kind of something I've struggled with over many years, because of course, in song lyrics, you've got um, you know, the pop singers who are just singing, I love you, baby, I love you, baby, blah, 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 love you, baby, right? And then you've got people like R.E.M., you know, who <laughs> I remember reading a uh, review of one of R.E.M.'s later albums where they said um, he's gotten to the point where he's enunciating his words more clearly. So we find ourselves now asking ourselves, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, now that we can understand the lyrics, we can't understand the lyrics. <laughs> and uh, so I've always kind of debated that in my mind is like, is it cool to be like, like these guys and, and be obscure or is it cooler to actually communicate? And, uh, and as I'm, reading some things like Paula's work here and a lot of some of the other more contemporary poetry. I'm also reminded of um, a concept that was taught to me in an art class when speaking about abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the teacher demonstrated through showing us on on the the PowerPoint screen a number of renditions of the same subject, each of them less detailed. So the first one was a very fine, precise, almost photorealistic rendition, then progressing all the way to what was essentially a sketch, progressing to what was um just a flurry of lines mm -hmm. and the teacher asked us okay at what point does it stop being that original thing and the truth was we could look at all of them and say well we can see the original in all of them but if we had just looked at the final ones the final few without seeing the original would we have made that connection so I'm, I'm kind of seeing a lot of these poems and their meanings as maybe the, the creator who is in her own life looking at the original or thinking about the original in her head. And she's giving us a, a very wispy abstraction and you know it's no wonder we can't figure out what it, what she's trying to say but then that's part of the way she's trying to say it is like um i don't know i'm kind of rambling here but it, it's some of the stuff that has been grinding through my head with this constant debate of um clarity versus abstraction you know could i address that well, just the, real quick? the real issue please, to me please is do. That the real issue to me is that ultimately they're both art yeah i think i think it has a lot to do with context um my experiences are not going to be like anybody like your experiences 
um, uh -huh. and it it's it's about the lens through which we view it. Um, just like you were saying, she's viewing the original through her lens. We're viewing it through whatever lens we come to the table with. And right. yeah, so so ultimately, if we all sat down and and tried to rewrite the same poem, it would it would come out different for every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are moments when you're looking at an abstract thing and suddenly the the original kind of clicks into place mm -hmm. almost like those ones where you're supposed to look at the jumble of oh, mm -hmm. magic things and you like cross your eyes and oh now i mm -hmm. see the image right aging myself <laughs> um yep i remember reading a, a poem by hang on um by my son's uh, um, pediatrician. It was a great man. And um, I remember reading this one that just made no sense to me. And I read it over, but it kind of haunted me. And I read it over and over again. And I suddenly realized, and it had like images of being compassionate and images of caring for a child and images of abuse of a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, my gosh, what is this? These are so disjointed. And then suddenly it clicked on me. He was describing the moment in his office when he realized that one of his child patients had been abused and that he must now report it. Mm. And that moment of shock that was happening in his life and so suddenly that more crystal reality got superimposed over this abstraction of the mm -hmm. poem in a very impactful way it was suddenly i was you know suddenly the poem got really deep really fast yes um the concept you're talking about earlier is something known as the ladder of abstraction where you take the thing over here, like um, Betsy the cow. And Betsy the cow, like, whoa, we know exactly what Betsy the cow is. And over here on the other end, the term you use is hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> both, both are Betsy the cow, but like Betsy became really abstract over here and we don't care about those things as much. <laughs> but the really beautiful thing, now, now note, we have to make, make, make this clear. Paula Mendoza is getting her PhD in creative writing. Mm -hmm. So she knows what she's doing here. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about that ladder of distraction thing, what I think is super awesome is she's using her voltas. And we've done this multiple times. She is using the volta of the poem consistently. It's like you don't know what all this stuff is. And all of a sudden you get to the volta and all that clicks in the picture it into clarity and you're like oh my gosh there's all of this other world underneath and then you have to sift through and explore this new world because you can see it now but it's so much and and i, I think the, the, i'm like i think of this poem we just read like um and i don't know i can't find i'm like and maybe someone can help me here I can't find the Volta here, but I'm like, I want to know more. I want to keep exploring this poem over and over because that lack just bothers me. I want to know what it is. And, I, and I, not necessarily because she, it's her lack. Because I feel like it's my lack and I want to know what that is. When you guys are both talking, it made me think about installation art pieces. You know, and some of these poems feel like that, like you're coming into a space and you're surrounded and you're kind of taking it all, you know, the sensory, there are all these things and you're trying to kind of take it in, but, 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 um, you know, and inhabiting a space in a way. And yeah, sometimes you have to just sit in that space. I think too, I like what you said, Mark, about how you had looked at different types of paintings because I like thinking about a poem as a work of art and I, I really like visual art and I'm a painter um, 
I'm thinking about poems in that sense, like a poem is an art piece and there are all types of art pieces, right? Like, just like we've got all kinds of styles of painting, there's, you know, impressionism and there's realism and there's cubism and all these different movements with poetry too. There are lots of different ways that you can explore and create your art. I, like, I love what J-Rod was saying about feeling like her lack was his lack. He wants to know, I feel like that's what's so magical about poetry is that a poet can can make you feel that lack, <laughs> can mm -hmm. extract that from you. And so that's, you know, a gift of hers to evoke those feelings, to put you in that place where she was. And even if you don't might not understand exactly what was happening, you you're feeling things. And I think that's the point. Yes. Rachel, did you have something um, you wanted to ask about or share? I did. I did, actually, because um, poetry is so unfamiliar to me. And hearing you all talk about poetry, like you live it and breathe it, which clearly you do. And I'm looking through her, her poetry and I, you know, like poetry doesn't have to make sense. But I always thought in my brain that it had to be the same, like it had to look the same. It had to rhyme it had to have a certain cadence to it and this is like not even from even from like this just in left by the ship it's like little tiny pieces and then this giant chunk of text and then little tiny pieces and then another giant i'm like what is happening i don't understand and then there's the you know the sentimental poem and the narrative poem they're huge and then we get to curator which is a mix again and then you get to love song and the least I can do. And there are these little tiny balanced that are, I mean, the least I can do too is very symmetrical. It looks very even on the page. I don't know. So visually for me, I'm like this. I don't even know how would I even know how to start writing poetry? How do you recommend, is there a book? Like j -Rod, you're talking about going to teach children how to do this, yeah? Mm -hmm. So if you were teaching a child, how to just get into poetry to express themselves. What would you recommend? Is there a resource? Is there a website? Is there a book they could read for Ooh, learning oh, the different that, forms? That is so techniques? good. Um, usually where I start when I am teaching people about poetry mm -hmm. is I start with a meditation and li literally, this will be absolutely one of the first things I do when I introduce my students to this um, next year. I start with the meditation, and in that meditation, we go to the world that we want the world that we want to live in. Like, what is the world, the ideal world you want to live in? And from actually getting to that space, the next thing I say, you don't need to know any rules. You don't need to have any sort of form in your head or anything. The whole entire goal then is afterwards, write about it. Because here's the most important thing. What you produce at that point will be poetry because you've, you've accomplished three things. You've given, you have an image in your head that you're trying to get to the reader so they understand it. Number two, you are having an emotional experience with that, with this thing that right here that enables you to be able to invest into this emotionally. This means something to you. Because you've done one and two, you've created something that has meaning to an audience. And that therefore you've created a poem. That's all this, mm -hmm. that's all a poem is. There's all sorts of things we can teach you about techniques to be able to get that, get deeper into all of that. Sure, but the most important thing to remember is poetry is about ultimately connecting with another human being on a visceral level. We're not talking about like, oh, I'm going to give you like, I can't, that's like, I'd like this little pat, like, oh yes, yes. That, oh, you, you're good, you're a good little kitty or something like, no, a good poem should feel like 
the poet sat down in your room and either they're telling you a story or you're experiencing an emotion with them. You literally have the reason why I think the lack sticks with me so much is because of the fact that she's talking about how something inside her is empty. And I think about the empty parts of me and I don't, and I want to explore them. She connected with that with me. That's an emotional thing. That's visceral in me. Those are the experiences that you wish to get to with your poetry. And when you start with the world as you want to see it be, guess what? You've also then done the most difficult thing I know to also do in poetry. Write a joy poem. Because poems that are happy <laughs> are significantly harder oh, to write than poems that are sad or bittersweet. And at that point in time, well, you can write anything. If you can write a happy poem, then we go to the place of you can literally write anything. And that's where your education of poetry begins. So. Um, I think um, exposure is big. The more you read, let them explore. Let them read what they want, what they like. Shel Silverstein, you know, like get them, get them interested. Get them to love words and the way they feel in your mouth and the way they sound in your ears and the way that they look on the page. Like, I think that's, that to me is foundation of, of you know, where I started with poetry. I think too, uh, you know, if you want, there are like particular forms, of course, you know, like sonnets and villanelles and whatnot, and you can get a book and, or haiku and learn those forms. Um, but in general, it seems like quite a lot of poets that are writing right now are more into free verse and kind of creating their own forms. So yeah, it could be helpful to just see what's out there and see what you like. Um, going back to that analogy of like being a visual artist, it's like having tools, right? Like you can have the tool of line breaks, breaking your line for impact in different ways or you know, have various uh, literary devices that you use like for sound quality and things like that, or metaphors, you know, all the different literary devices you could think of as like paintbrushes and whatnot. So I think reading different poets and seeing what resonates with you and how they use those tools can kind of start to inform. And sometimes it's really helpful to try to copy, you know, like mm -hmm. one, one class I took, we had to try to make our own like imitation of the style of a lot of different writers. And I thought it was really helpful because then it's like, you're trying those tools and seeing like, is this a good fit for me? Are there things here that I like that let me express what I want to express? And so that could be a good way to um, poetry foundation website is really nice because you can look by topic. <laughs> and so if there's some kind of topic you're interested in, then you can see how a lot of different poets have like approached that. So for example, recently I was reading um, like poems about ecology and the environment and seeing how different poets have like approached that topic. Or I was looking at like war poems and you can find ones from different eras and different styles and all those kinds of things. So that can be a good way to kind of see different approaches and possibilities too. I like what you were saying about different forms. And I feel like there's a discipline to be like, some people don't feel like there's discipline to poetry, but I really feel like training yourself, like write the haiku, make it work. It's just an exercise that's going to make all the rest of your poetry better. If you know how to work within form, then when you break that form and you do the free verse, you're doing it with intent and it's more impactful for me anyway. <laughs> thank you so much for that that was really helpful because I just I don't know it's daunting and I don't know where to get started but I have ideas and I'm like I don't know how to start so another thing so there are people out there who have, have books that are really really helpful Mary Oliver a poetry handbook I literally yes. have folks who I'm I, I'm going to be teaching a small poetry oh, class to I'm giving this book to them it is fantastic for you to start learning the basics. Yes. Remember, like, and no, most, most basic thing to me 
is have an experience. Tell me about the experience. You make certain you connect with the experience and then share it with me. That's poetry. That is always how simple poetry is. Okay. When you're ready to level up, there's a book called Structure and Surprise. This turns poetry into chess because you're now learning different variations of how to actually reach out to people and manipulate their emotions because we're writers. We manipulate people's emotions. That's what we do. We want to, we want you to feel the thing. And if we can have you feel it better, all, all the better day for us. Now, when you get really, really, really nerdy into poetry and you're like, I want to do all the things. You get the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics. Are you going to put these in the comments in the chat? I can, I actually can It'll take me a minute to do that. But yeah, um, <laughs> this thing is, it's a tomb. Can you turn it but, over again? The, the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics. I'm seriously writing these all down. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. All of these things are great. Now, no, do I open this thing a lot to be like, oh, I need to know something about basic about poetry. No, this is to go to when I have big questions about concepts I don't understand. And it's glorious when I do, because it's like opens up whole new worlds. It's beautiful. Keep in mind when we're talking poetry, I also write fiction. I will be absolutely honest with you. The rabbit holes of how you to do fiction it's just as deep for poetry and it's just as beautiful. And uh, uh, J-Rod, who, who is the author of Structure and Surprise? I didn't grab that. Uh, let me, let me, let me throw all those in the little chat. Cause I, I put, I put Mary Oliver in there already, but. So a poetry handbook. Yep. Got that one. That's Mary in the chat. Oliver. Yep. Oh, yep. Yep. I see it in the chat now. Um, structure and surprise. Who is that one by? Structure and surprise is edited. Edited by Michael Thune. You'll have multiple different poets in there who are sharing things. And okay. as, as you read the book, you actually find there's a website for it. So there's even more, like, because it never ends. Like, Wait, how there's awesome. more. Yes, there's more. Um, <laughs> and the last one is the Princeton. Princeton. Can I ask one thing before we wrap it all up? Um, sure. Of the three panelists. Can we hear one of each of yours? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm open to that. Let me grab Ooh. one. Yeah, same. Let me open my... Last one is the... Um, Thank you for those titles, J-Rod. That's amazing. Um, I think this is edited by... Yes, this, is, this one's edited by... Edited by... Roland Green. <coughs> I'm going to wait to share till the end because I ha I've often had people say they do not like going after me. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Well, la di da. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Are you gonna light your guitar on fire? Well, nope. poetry is so <laughs> subjective and it's so personal and it's so different for me for everybody. Um, so styles are going to vary. Uh, voice is going to vary. Mm -hmm. um, but we've heard you guys talk all night about this wonderful poems, and I'd love to hear what you guys do with your own too. Well, hold on a second. I don't know which one to. Do you want one that's been published or one that I'm working on? <laughs> That's immaterial. I want something that's going to speak to me. Oh boy. There you go. There's the criteria. I'll just share my I'm most recent. I'm just saying, let's hear some. 
Okay, I've got one that I can share. <laughs> it might not be my best, but it's one that's recent. And so I, I won't explain it, I'll just read it. Um, it's called 1986. <clears throat> Sometimes when the slant of the sun is just right, I can take myself back, back, back to the feeling of shag carpeting between my toes, hyper-focused threads of gold and red and amber, acrid dust from the heater vents, the high-pitched whine of the emergency broadcast system instead of Sesame Street. I press my face against the domed glass, hyper-focused, tiny red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue blocks that somehow make a big yellow bird and the space shuttle white and the fire orange and the ocean blue black. Oh. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. That was a poetry challenge about your first memory of a newscast <laughs> that I did. For National Poetry Month. Awesome. Um, I can read one. Uh, I guess a trigger warning. Um, lately, a lot of the poetry I've been writing is focused on the war in Ukraine. So if you don't want to hear that, then you've been warned now. Um, okay, so this one is called In Mariupol Tonight. I can't sleep all these days. The swelling baby girl inside me insists on stretching, jolting, prodding, already making space for herself in this world. And so I scroll. What else do you do? That's when I see her, softly glowing like an angel through the light of my pocket-sized screen. Like me, her belly's ripe as a melon, striped and taut. Her bed sheets even resemble watermelons, red, green, everything that says life. She lays on her side, hand resting along her growing curvature, but behind her, rubble, smoke, glassless windows, debris, not a hint of spring. Like pallbearers, soldiers ring her wheeled gurney. One holds his arm out, making way, but going where? Is there anywhere to go? It's not until days later I hear the news. Mother, baby, lives ripe and full, Instead, gone, rotted on the vine. A small foot jabs my ribs as the glowing words hit my eyes like missiles. I turn, the tiny foot wills it so, but not before I feel the wet of pillows sticking to my dripping cheeks. So, that's that Beautiful, one. Sierra. I like that we don't have to wonder what that one means. Yeah. All right. I'm 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 sitting here doing the thing of I normally do. I ask the question, do you want to hear something? Um do you want to hear something super, super recent, or would you rather hear something that is um still very very fresh like i haven't finished it yet either one here's what i'd kind of like to hear again um and since i made the initial request maybe this carries a little weight but since you're a performance poet i'd like to hear something that you can really perform something like that so i can really hear the difference between a, just a red poem and a performed poem yes i agree I concur. <laughs> okay, cool. That tells me exactly what I should do. Okay. Um, Rachel, is it possible for me to, um, is it possible for me to um, do share you screen. Uh, share my screen? Yeah, it's available anytime. Okay, let me see. I didn't know. I didn't know. I just wanted to ask. I give consent. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> this poem is called Ghosts of My Confidence, Voices of Love, Self, and Shame. 
You are black and beautiful. I am 100% weird. Why don't you play basketball? <laughs> Where did you get that scar? Making people laugh is my superpower. God, why are you so loud? You can create anything. Grammar is the best drug. My child is worthless. You should write a book. Do you like my stories? Nobody understands what you are saying. You are a good person. Good people hate themselves. You are worthy to walk with God now. Breaking my ceramic heart, beating heart is the bloodiest, no, best work of my life. Destroy your lungs too. You are still too loud. I mix water and blood and inhale the concrete produced. If I drown, I'll be worthy of living. You are, God damn it, soldier. You can't hurt a fly. But aren't they alive? Doesn't life have worth? Stop thinking. Nobody wants to know what you think. You are. Break your fingers. Tell the story of Jesus, not your nonsense. You and your stories aren't worth anyone's time. I am a child of God, and he has sent me here, has given me lies. They are giving you lies. There is only one truth. You are broken. Jesus will heal you. Obedience is the way has given me. Listen to me. I love, we love you. As long as you are quiet, as long as you are reverent, as long as you are dead has given me. You are. <laughs> I've had enough of the devil hurting you. I killed them for you. But what if we had given the devil love? Would they still be a devil? Now I need you to join me because there are no homosexual humans. Spread this truth. No, that's not true. It's just as true as the life of Christ. Then Christ is a lie. We love you. We would never lie to you. Then why did you encourage my, my silence, shame my loudness, or tell me, not never tell me I was good enough even once? Your obedience and the blood of Christ made you worthy. Now you can be whole. My heart is broken. My lungs filled with concrete. I hate my skin, my stories, and my history. And I did it for your love. You did it to walk with God. To spurn unrighteousness. To be holy. And all it cost me was everything. I'm sorry, God. If you exist, you'll understand. Your mother was right. You are. Bang! 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 Now, both of the devils are dead. How do I find who I actually am? Thank that was you. amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing it.
Thanks for sharing. Really cool structure that you had. I liked being able to see how you put it. Form making meaning. It's my jam. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. <sighs> I'll end this with one thing. As all of you felt that poem, if you look at me right now, you can see I'm shaken by having just performed it. That's the most important thing about writing poetry. If you can connect with your own emotions when you write it, others will connect with what they hear. That's the magic. And I now turn the time back over to Rachel for any official business with the league or anything like that before we close. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, J-Rod and Kelly and Sierra. This was an amazing night of beautiful words and thank you for sharing and teaching us. And I just ordered a poetry book it's going to be here next week. So I'm excited. Yay! So thank you. Thank you for those suggestions. And um, thank you so much for joining us on our beautiful community book club. Join us on the last Friday of May to discuss the afterword by E.K. Johnston, who is one of our keynotes for the Quills Conference. You won't want to miss it. It's one of my favorite books of hers. And if you haven't read it, it is so fun and beautiful and I loved it. So anyway, thank you so much and I will see you next month. Thank you. Thanks everybody.